สักขอแข่งลุ้นมิสเตอร์สปีกเกอร์ฟิสต์ไลค์ทูดิคลาร์ดแอดไอฟ์วอร์กเอสอาร์ตเอ็ดูเคเตอร์ทิชชิงในสกูลทิชชิงในเอ็นไอเอทิชชิงทีเชอร์สและคอมมูนิตี้สโอเวอร์ทั้งสองสิบสี่ปีบนแบบของการอาร์ตและคุณลักษณะพิเศษที่ดีมากๆนั่นคือการพูดถึงการตัดสินใจในการพัฒนาการเรียนของเราในอนาคตที่เราควรจะพิจารณาความเปลี่ยนแปลงในทิศทางของเราที่จะช่วยให้เราคาดการณ์ความเปลี่ยนแปลงในทิศทางของเราถ้าสถานการณ์ที่เราอยู่ในปัจจุบันยังเป็นเช่นนี้ดังนั้นอะไรที่เราเห็นในอนาคตจะช่วยให้เทคโนโลยีการเปลี่ยนแปลงที่เราเห็นในอนาคตจะช่วยให้เราคาดการณ์ความเปลี่ยนแปลงในทิศทางของเราและในความสัมพันธ์ระหว่างคนในแบบของความเปลี่ยนแปลงในทิศทางของเราและความสัมพันธ์ระหว่างคนในแบบของความเปลี่ยนแปลงในทิศทางของเราและความสัมพันธ์ระหว่างคนในแบบของความเปลี่ยนแปลงในทิศทางของเราและความสัมพันธ์ระหว่างคนในแบบของความเปลี่ยนแปลงในทิศทางของเราและความสัมพันธ์ระหว่างคนในแบบของความเปลี่ยนแปลงในทิศทางของเราและความสัมพันธ์ระหว่างคนในแบบของความเปลี่ยนแปลงในทิศทางของเราและความสัมพันธ์ระหว่างคนในแบบของความ悲观是一种远见 ，pessimism is a form of foresight. In identifying possible negative outcomes, we can then work together collectively to come up with new ways of addressing this crisis before they become reality. I say collectively because I believe it is essential for us to break away from the sense of alienation many of us feel when faced with these challenges. To do that, we must better understand the complexities of these disruptions. So that we can present better solutions, suggestions to tackle them. To better understand the future of that young people wish to see, recently I asked a group of young youths about their hopes, dreams, and concerns. Among the responses include a call for transparency that truths should not be distorted just so that some can achieve their personal goals, a plea for kindness to others, especially those who are different from us, an exhortation for people to. Collaborate and work together rather than pursue self-serving gains. And one particularly poignant call by this young lady who said, "She hopes we as human beings do not lose our faith in humanity." All these hopes shared by youth are heartening, because they point to a few key points: open-heartedness, teamwork, deep listening, and engagement, all of which are essential for true constructive discourse. Yet in recent times, when there are disagreement, People resort to either one of these two modes: either to agree to disagree and just leave it as that, or to disagree vehemently, engage in keyboard warrior tactics on the internet, and wage a litany of complaints on other channels. There is no discourse. There is no empathy or desire to listen. It is you versus me, us versus them, my truth versus yours. I'm reminded of the recent incident of a group of people organized under a Facebook group accusing the Esplanade. Of promoting bestiality, when the latter displayed an artwork of Singapore artist Vincent Liao at a community walk on the third level of the Esplanade, the artwork was subsequently removed. But what is disconcerting is that that was a simplistic misreading of an artistic work. Is this the sort of discourse we want for our future? A reactionary one that seeks to ban works, complain, call out, label, and shame without dialogue? Why does one group so quickly jump to impose its moral value on others? Why should the louder voice always be the one abided to before all sides tell their story and come to a point of agreement with negotiation and mediation? Is it that the complainant's version of truth is a singular one that everyone else must accept? The world does not comprise only one simplistic moral or ethical view. Just like how we look at one object, not by observing the parts that are lit. But also those defined by shadows. So it is that the world comprises different shades, contexts, and perspectives. I bring this up because this course is something fundamental and integral in education, specifically in the study of humanities. Through literature, history, geography, and the arts, we develop a keen sensibilities for nuances, differences, and complexities. Take, for instance, the dream of Rick Chamber. Which, when studied from a humanistic approach, is not just a literature text to be examined; rather, it is a very nuanced study of humankind, of society, of politics, of culture and arts. We discover that being human through that book means having to deal with a different aspect of living: social, political, emotional, psychological, spiritual, physical, carnal, and metaphysical. Yes, dreams of Rick Chamber do talk about carnal desires. We learn the power of empathy by seeking to understand and deeply appreciate 
how each of these characters are like, and of course, including their shadows. Why is this important? Because we don't want a future society without empathy. Education plays such a crucial role here, because our young ones should be given the opportunity to explore in school under the guidance of teachers, so that they learn at a tender age about the complexity of humanity. Without this, we will likely have a generation of people lacking in empathy, believing only in one's value and unable to comprehend or accept vulnerability in humans' existence. In fact, even in the study of science, technology, mathematics, the focus is not merely on the discovery of theorems, theories and inventing things. Rather, great scientists and inventors view nature with awe and are constantly searching for humanity's relationship with nature to understand rather than to alter it. This is because they are acutely aware that the search for truth is a quest in humility. We search because we are ignorant, and in acknowledging our imperfection and ignorance, we open our hearts and minds to learn and improve. As Lessing, the philosopher, put it succinctly, it is not the truth that a man possesses or believes that he possesses, but the earnest effort which he puts forward to reach for truth, which constitutes the worth of a man. So, where would be the best place for such complex studies of the humanities happen? Naturally, it's in our education institution, which provide a safe space where our young people can grapple with these conundrums in life, ponder deeply about difference, and come to a better understanding and empathies of others. This is also how educators help develop critical thinking in the young. Now, in Singapore, we have been emphasizing the importance of critical thinking, but critical thinking is not just about differentiating what is good or bad, or what works or not. In teaching critical thinking, a lot of emphasis has been placed on the methodology of problem solving. That is to say, one learns to analyze the problem, then suggest solutions before evaluating its results. There's also an emphasis on dialogic learning. Allow me to quote Paulo Freire, the pedagogue who advocated problem-posing approach, dialogic learning and critical pedagogy. To him, Dialogue, I quote, cannot exist without the profound love of the world, unquote. And problem-posing education, a quote again, affirms men and women as being in the process of becoming, unquote. So, a good critical thinker is someone who has a curiosity in how human beings think, act, and feel. This desire to understand another person's perspective, objectives, fears, and hope is a first step towards critical thinking, and then towards empathy. The study of humanities will go a long way in developing our critical thinking skills. As such, I appeal the Minister, Ministry of Education to deepen its efforts in ensuring that humanities are studied deeply and widely. It should and must be an integral part of our pedagogical approach towards knowledge acquisition and the overall formations of our youth. I spoke earlier about Curiosity being a building block of critical thinking. And I believe that people, young and old alike, are inherently curious folks. We want to know how things work, why policies are made, when something will affect us, and how extensive that will be. Yet, and as the saying goes, many may buy into the notion that curiosity kills the cat. Asking too many questions is sometimes seen as divesting energies in something that's irrelevant. It sidetracks from the task orientation. In a world that seeks efficiency, maximize profit, and maximum satisfaction, it is easy to take the bitten and proven path. But by doing so, we have sacrificed our natural instinct for curiosity as well. I remember how I met professor in NUS, Professor Li Pengyi, proved theorems during lectures. He suddenly knew all the right steps to do so. But interestingly, he would deliberately permit himself to take detours, try alternatives, until he met with an obstacle. Was he wasting his students' time as he meandered and hit roadblocks? Not in the least. In fact, his trajectory was illuminating because as he traced his step back, he talked about why this path did not work and how we would perhaps try another path instead. His deep curiosity was infectious, and I remember it fondly until now. Curiosity is about getting lost, by allowing oneself to do so without fear. Any inventor or artist will tell you the same thing, that the fun part of creation is when you're trying to find your way around when you're experimenting and discovering the world in the process. There should be no fear in that, but rather we should become accustomed to the promise that it brings with it. Now, once, once again, 
The question is, where is the best and safest place to allow young people to be lost and explore? The answer again is our education institutions. They are well equipped to guide young people, young explorers and creators in life as they find their own individual paths. Through this detour, they can discover curvatures and gradients instead of a straight line movement from point A to B. They can explore shapes shape and shades and become more three-dimensional in the outcome, in the outlook. Unfortunately, our education system is too preoccupied with quick results that there is little time permitted for such holistic growth and exploration. I don't know how many teachers can do as properly did in my maths class. I don't know how many people get to benefit from that curiosity so that they learn what doesn't work as much as what can. In today's competitive, result-oriented world, we tussle to be number one all the time. This narrative has also permeated our education system and has become part of our cultural DNA. We may laugh about how Singaporeans are kiasu and kiasi, but in accepting these traits we, with, with humour, we are also legitimising these self-serving attitudes and behaviour. We have normalised this race for instant gratifications, for accolades when we are winners and not second best. So to ensure results, we instill discipline and rigour. We tell our young people, yes, it's good for you to try new things, but make sure you get those grades and you will fall be or you will fall behind in life. We, we remind them that life is a competition. Fulfilment is to be the best. But is competition the best way so that, that we can be? I seriously doubt so. Like it or not, competition creates silos and, or, and alienations. We are a small nation of about 5.6 million. Should we create a race to the last for 5.6 million individuals so that some privileged one amongst us or some able body among us can be the best? How about harnessing our collective capabilities instead through collaboration so that we as a nation can move mountains at no one's expenses? Can our education system reflect an idea of how we want our society to be? Like what our fellow members, uh, Ms. Dennis Poir, has just said, in my opinion, the schools are places where you can learn such life skills. That there is much merit in collaboration. A, prolifer a proliferation of competition can lead to a cancerous situation. In removing competitive elements from our education system, schools can become more inclusive and equitable, and young people can discover the full potential of their innate curiosity. Humanities and the cultivation of curiosity is not only reserved for the academically inclined. And like the situation during my time in school, you no longer need to be more proficient in language and writing to be studying literature or the arts. Rather, curiosity is a leveler. It is present whether you are academically inclined or otherwise, and it should continue to be nurtured regardless of how smart, how privileged you are. But I can imagine what the rebuttal to this might be. Do we have time to be curious? How do we make time for quality learning through discovery and having this discussion on the humanities? A parent of a young boy once told me that her kid had initially enjoyed preschool, which was full of play and discovery, but the moment he went to kindergarten, the pressure of academic pursuit reared its ugly head. By the time he was in primary school, when the PSL primary tree, when PSLE loomed ominously ahead in the coming years, the honeymoon period was over. She noticed that her son has lost his sense of curiosity. Now, is PSLE really necessary? I'm aware that this question has been mooted before, and I believe it is important for us to ponder more deeply about it even now. If young students have to prepare for a major examination after an initial six years of study, does it impede their ability to learn deeply, discover and investigate? I think we need to fundamentally agree on what is important in the education of our young people. Is it deep learning and, and interaction? If so, can we rethink the current system to make time for this aspect rather than rush them through national education that determine their path at so tender an age? I've heard sharings of young people talking about how PSL is such a scary thing. Children who studied so hard yet couldn't get the result he wanted and became angry and smashed a chair. This is not normal. This is not right. I am a product of such kind of education, the competition, the exam the pressure that comes with shame and fear, and I still have nightmares of not completing my exams. Maybe some of you would have also. I was, it was only in theatre that I found the meaning of collaboration when we are working in productions, when we use the best of our ability to make the most meaningful work. 
Theatre making provides a different model of learning, working with each other's strengths, respecting each other's differences, incorporating different opinions for the sake of trying to present a complex world of existence. I always think that theatre making is an alternative schooling method, one built on collaboration, not competition. We should seriously consider slaughtering this sacred cow of the PSLE. The Scandinavian system has provided certain possibilities for us to look at. Of course, I'm not saying that we simply emulate their system. Naturally, for any change, there is a need for plenty of political will, and the government and the people must commit to such a change. But as a start, I think it is important to begin discussing this process of change so that we can chart a roadmap forward and as well as addressing parents' anxiety over the issues. And with that, I really support <coughs> my fellow member, Denise Poir, for her suggestion on the master plan. And this master plan should include looking at classroom sizes, assessment models, and the capacity of teachers. I wouldn't want to talk about classroom sizes because just now my colleague, uh, 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 Xiaoyin, has talked about it. But I want to talk about assessment again, which I think it is an, an important aspect of learning. Yet today our assessment methods are still focused on the quantity that students have learned rather than the quality of their learning and retention. I think many of us are aware of diagnostic assessment, where assessment is used to diagnose students' needs so that the learning process can be improved to help them acquire knowledge better. In short, diagnostic assessment is less about KPIs, more about taking the interest of each individual child at heart, it means education to harness his or her, or her skill to address his or her needs and to encourage and groom each child's unique strength. Now, if we adopt such a fundamental shift in thinking about assessment, it will change how lessons are being taught and subsequently how individual learning journeys can be scaffolded. It changes relationship between teachers and parents, between teachers and students and among students themselves. It becomes an approach that is not about competition, and not about fighting to be the best, but more about discovery, collaboration, and being the best together rather than alone. Now I'll talk about educators who are instrumental in shaping our young people. And I've worked with teachers for many years, and we heard about how much work they have to do, and a lot of event organizing they've done. In fact, there's a joke that goes around that, you know, if they want a second career, they can consider being event organizer. Now, but I've known from personal encounter that most teachers are incredibly passionate about teaching and draw their greatest pleasure from daily interactions with students. However, with increasing demands on how lessons should be taught, for instance, new pedagogical approaches such as inquiry learning, uh, based learning, or TLLM, teachers who are products of our previous education system have found it challenging to move into these matters. It's not for lack of trying, or the willingness to try, but that they need more time to adapt and experiment. Unfortunately, while these new approaches taken on to alleviate pressure and produce more well-rounded students are beneficial, the runway for teachers to adapt them and produce the same results is simply too short. Hence, I think we need to give more space for teachers to learn and experiment, and the way to do this is to relieve them of their administrative duties. Now, a final word for the parents. Well, I'm a parent too. I know intimately the pressures of parenting and I'm familiar with the worries that any parent has about well-being and performance of our kids in school. But let's be honest. Parents are equally responsible in the education of our children. In our bid to make a living, to ensure that we best provide for our children materially, have we become so caught up with work that there is a trade-off in our time spent with them? Have we also passed on that role of education fully to teachers rather than undertake part of it ourselves? In doing so, have we become the source of stress for teachers, constantly checking to, down them, harassing them, being critics of them, and as if we know better and can tell teachers how to teach the children better? So here's my plea to parents like myself. Parents, take a step back. A teacher has to take care of more than one class of students. Your child's teacher has more than one wards, has more wards than your, just, just your kids. Mr. Cock, you have about half a minute left. Okay. Teachers have a job to fulfill to the best of capabilities, and that is true, but they are human too. So, rather see them. So don't treat teachers like you are a customer, that you are a salesperson, that they are salesperson at your back and call. Rather, see them as equal, 
because that is what they are trying to do, to work with you and not for you, or for the benefits of your child. Finally, I will say that there is hope, and all is not lost. There is room for change and collaboration, and that's why I'm so deeply thankful for this motion so that we can take in all these thoughts and ideas and hope that the government will seriously consider making a huge revamp on our education system. Thank you. And we hope that parents will also take heed.